Good day, everyone. While we wait for all our participants to join us, let us first watch a short music video of the song Calvario or Calvary or Suffering in English from the artist group Musicians for Peace.
Time check, it is already exactly 9 p.m. in Philippine time. And thank you for joining us in today's webinar. Before we begin, here are some reminders and house rules for the whole duration of the webinar. To those who would like to listen in other languages, just look for the language interpretation button that you can find in the lower right portion of your Zoom screen. Here, you may select the language that you want to listen to. We have interpreters for the languages Filipino and Bahasa. If you enabled language interpretation and you only want to listen to the interpreted language, you may also click the mute original audio button. We will be having an open forum after the discussion of all the speakers. Please use the Q&A button of Zoom to send your questions. Questions should be clear and concise. Kindly indicate if the question is addressed to a specific speaker or to all speakers. And for those who are watching on Facebook, you may send your questions by commenting on the Facebook Live video. Again, questions must be clear and concise, and if possible, indicate if the question is addressed to a specific speaker or to both of them. For, an ans for unanswered questions due to time constraints, the General Secretariat of ILPS will be compiling the questions for sending to the speakers. Your questions could also be addressed in future materials or outputs across the ILPS platforms. Again, warm greetings of solidarity to everyone. I am your moderator for today's webinar. I am Monsi, and I teach Philippine Studies in the Department of Filipino and Philippine Literature of the University of the Philippines, Diliman. I am also a member of the Congress of Teachers and Educators for Nationalism and Democracy. Again, welcome to the People's Struggle for National and Social Liberation, Development, and Lasting Peace. This is the International League of People's Struggles closing webinar for the end the U.S. Duterte regime webinar series. Our first webinar was on September 11. And here we were able to present the Philippines situation as a semi-colonial and semi-feudal state. Then on September 25, we discussed the Philippines place in the evolving contradictions of states vying for power and wealth in the imperialist system. Today's webinar, the final one in the series, tackles liberation movements. We discuss the anti-imperialist legal democratic movement and its prospects. And again, we are live streaming on Facebook. So please like, share, and spread the word about our webinar with the hashtag and US Duterte regime. To formally start our webinar today, we have Pastor Alan Sarte, ordained minister of the United Church of Christ in the Philippines, or UCCP. He's also a member of the Secretariat of the People's Forum for Peace for Life and ILPS Philippines Secretary General. Again, let's have Pastor Alan to give our welcome remarks. Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you are at this time. Welcome to this uh, third and last of a series of uh, and the U.S. Duterte regime, an educational webinar series and September 21 Global Day of Solidarity Action for the National and Democratic Struggle in the Philippines. As already mentioned, we began this webinar series last September 11 on the topic understanding the roots of the crisis of semi-colonial and semi-feudal Philippines. We try to look at the internal domestic, socio-historical development and conditions which gave rise to the crisis and conflicts in the Philippines. We were one in saying that under the Duterte administration, the conditions of the country have only worsened. 
The second webinar was held last September 25th on the topic, Imperialism in a Multipolar World, Where Does the Philippines Stand? In this webinar, we try to situate the, the place of the Philippines in the imperialist wars and how the US-China tensions are affecting the country. Now, this last of the three webinars, as mentioned, focuses on people's struggle for national and social liberation, development, and lasting peace. And we are uh, very uh, grateful for our uh, distinguished speakers for tonight, Professor Jose Maria Sison and Antonio Tuhan Jr. Now, let me take this opportunity on behalf of ILPS Philippines to thank the ILPS member organizations and networks and allies across the globe for the strong support for this series of educational webinars. Thank you all for affirming your militant solidarity with the struggles of the Filipino people in resisting Duterte's fascist government and its imperialist masters. Day by day and across the globe, we are witnessing a growing discontent of the people to the Duterte government because of its wanton corruption, bungling of the pandemic response, widespread and vicious human rights abuses, the co-towing to China and US interest, and its continuing exposure as a fascist government. Calls for accountability and cases filed in the ICC are now hounding the 30s administration. But desire to avoid responsibility, responsibility for his crimes by attempting to keep himself and his cronies in power beyond 2022 will only further build the demand of the people to end the, U, the Duterte regime. Although just today we read of uh, Duterte's retirement from politics and shelving his plan to run as vice president. What this really means and what are the implications, we do not know yet. One thing is sure though, whether Duterte is still here or not, but the semi-colonial and semi-feudal character of Philippine society remains. The struggle for national and social liberation, for development and for a just and lasting peace. This is what our seminar, webinar for tonight is all about. Becomes more demanding and imperative. And the U.S. Duterte regime, long live international solidarity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Alan, for opening our webinar today. Indeed, our webinar series spanned a wide range of topics, all about the Philippines and its struggle against imperialism. We reiterate our call and the U.S. Duterte regime. And now, without further ado, we move to our first speaker. Our first speaker was one of the founders of Ibon Philippines in 1976, and also the founder of the Asia Pacific Research Network in 1998. He has also worked as a labor organizer, educator, writer, and editor, and also a cultural worker. He is currently the editor of the Institute of Political Economy in Manila, Philippines. Let us all welcome our first speaker, Sir Antonio Tuhan Jr. Sir Tuhan? Sir Tuhan, I think you are uh, muted. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that introduction and Thank you also, comrades and friends, for attending this seminar. Uh, indeed, uh, it's important to put in place the different aspects that has been to understand the Philippine struggle since this seminar series. And now uh, I would like to uh, present the discussion on the legal democratic movement. The Revolutionary People's Movement of the Philippines for National and Social Liberation 
seeks to end U.S. imperialism, feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism. Since the independence or the sham independence of the Philippines um, in the 1980s and uh, 1940s, you've had uh, the indirect rule of U.S. imperialism through its puppet bureaucrat capitalists in power, which are actually coming from the landlord and big bourgeoisie comprador class. The legal democratic movement has to uh, start first on a strong understanding of the nature of reactionary politics, meaning to say the nature of the struggle of the legal democratic movement has to contend with one, the nature of the state, and at the same time also the objectives for national liberation and social liberation. You have the landlord comprador uh, creation of a bureaucrat capitalist state that is implementing a sham democratic system in the Philippines. We all know that has its sham and it is um, even though the all over the world, there is no real democracy, but in the Philippines, that democracy is really a sham. It's a charade. So there is no such thing as a rule of law. And the legal democratic movement has the responsibility to expose the sham character of the so-called democratic system in the Philippines and to bring it down. Therefore, we have to understand that in the first place, the laws are fake. They are a sham, it looks very nice, but in reality, it does not uh, fulfill the objectives of the people's demands for liberation and democracy. Furthermore, there is no rule of law and whatever uh, system exists in democracy so called is subverted through corruption principally by imperialism and uh, feudal uh, patronage. This is further exacerbated by the fascist character of the state. So what we have are sham politics in in government, in Congress, and so on. And these now have to be exposed and presented uh, through the struggle, the campaigns and struggles of the legal democratic movement. The legal democratic movement in the Philippines is only secondary to the struggle of the revolutionary people. Our main strategy is people's war. And therefore, the legal democratic movement, which is principally in the urban areas, is meant to draw the, uh, the attention to the, of the public to the need for a radical change in our society. And you do that by exposing the sham democracy that exists in the Philippines. And at the same time, to do that, you can uh, expose its sham character principally through democratic struggle. So the legal democratic uh, movement operates principally in the urban areas. Meaning to say, when we say urban areas, it means the main centers and the secondary centers, the little towns, are essentially countryside. And there, the responsibility is to demand meaningful change, to promote system change, and therefore, the responsibility of legal struggles is to support the ultimate struggle to arouse, organize, and mobilize the masses for revolution wherever you are, 
whether you are in the cities or you are in the countryside. And that is the role of the legal democratic movement. The legal democratic in the Philippines combines the role or the elements of political activist organizations. We know about KMU, Bayan, the Anak Bayan, the youth, Gabriela. These are the activists, the national democratic activist organizations. But it's, that is not just the democratic movement. Uh, behind them and among them are the, the masses who are uh, linked to these uh, organizations through grass organ grassroots organizations, whether the grassroots organizations in the urban poor areas, the factories, the, uh, the schools, and so on. And there uh, they uh, conduct struggle on the day-to-day -day at the group grassroots level. The strength of KMU, Anakbayan, Gabriela comes from the strength of the grassroots movements. And therefore, when we look, about the look at the legal democratic movement, first think of it as the grassroots movements in the factories, in the communities, and the schools. And eventually, of course, the, the large movements that, uh, that you'll find in the large urban areas of the Philippines. Part of the legal democratic movement also, the third part, is alliance work. Meaning to say, not only do the activist organizations mobilize and organize at the grassroots levels, the, these active uh, activist organizations also conduct alliance work with the middle forces, with other organizations that, uh, that have uh, democratic aspirations, as well as anti-imperialist aspirations. And the backbone, therefore, obviously, when we talk about the legal democratic movement in the Philippines, the backbone of that are the militant mass movements of the workers, the urban poor, the, uh, the students, the, um, the women. We, we also include, of course, the legal peasant movement and by extension, the migrant workers movement abroad, which are still part of the legal democratic movement in the Philippines. They still, uh, they contribute tremendously to the legal democratic movement, even though they are abroad. All of these components of the legal democratic movement should be understand, understood as a broad mass movement, meaning to say, therefore, the legal democratic movement combines the, the, the participation and organizations of uh, the workers, uh, the urban poor, the youth, women, and uh, even also legal, uh, legal peasant organizations in, in some areas. And this now also link up with the legal, with alliance, with, through alliance work with other organizations. So for example, if we look at the trade union, the Kilosang Mayu Uno is the, is the largest labor center, especially in the 80s. It was, this, it was almost hegemonic in its character. Now it is not as strong, but still remains as one of the strongest uh, trade union centers in the Philippines. But the more important thing is, is that it's anti-imperialist, it is democratic, it, it promotes genuine trade unionism. It is composed of unions from the grassroots with federations, independent unions and others. But at the same time, KMU links itself with other federations and other unions who are friendly and take a progressive character. And this uh, broad workers' movement in the Philippines is a backbone 
of the legal democratic movement, not only fighting for trade union rights, not only fighting for trade, trade union demands like ending, ending contractualization and so on, but actually providing itself as a backbone of the urban movement in the Philippines. Now, with KMU, are the other workers and semi-proletarian organizations in Kadamai. So Kadamai is a broad network of organizations, mostly community-based, and these semi-proletarian organizations push for their demands, both welfare, but also the, the, the workers' or workers' demands for livelihood and jobs, and also uh, uh, to end, you know, imperialist control and the the fascist, anti-democratic, uh, ter tyrannical rule. Along with the uh, workers and uh, and the urban poor. Uh, the youth provide a key uh, role as the backbone and the, a spearhead in terms of propaganda for the mass movement in the Philippines. So Anak Bayan and the League of the Filipino Students, along with other uh, specific organizations of students like the National Union of Students in the Philippines, which is the alliance of councils of universities and high schools, the journalists, the CEGP, and uh, for example, the uh, student Christian movement in the Philippines, these youth organizations provide a strong support and a backbone also, a role in the back, being a backbone of the, the legal democratic movement. They bring up uh, the issues of national liberation and democracy, and all at the same time, at the same time, uh, also raise the issues of students in relation to tuition fee, uh, and of course, uh, fighting fascist repression. Gabriela is the world known, world, world known uh, women's movement in the Philippines. It is a basic movement and has a role as a backbone of the movement. But of course, uh, for us, the women's movement is intersectional, meaning to say when uh, Gabriela has uh, the KMK, which is the Association of Workers, they have Samakana, which is the Association of the Urban Poor Women, they have Amihan, which is the Association of Women Peasants. And there, these organizations, which are allied members of uh, Gabriela, uh, express their uh, participation as women in the class movements, meaning to say, therefore, being intersectional, the, uh, the role of women in the Philippines is expressed principally in their participation in class, uh, class movements of the workers and peasants. Um, besides the, these basic movements, uh, we, there are also uh, movements for, of the middle forces. So we have, for example, uh, the Alliance of Concerned Teachers, uh, and contend, which are important uh, mass movements of the middle forces. You have the Alliance of Health Workers and Head. For the health workers, you have, uh, for the church people, you have the propo promotion for people's, uh, Christian people's response, NCCP and others. You have the NUPL of the lawyers, and NUJP of the journalists. The middle forces provide a strong um, further combination of the mass movements of the workers and peasants with the women and the youth, but at the same time, the role of the professionals that then uh, contribute as uh, a contribution for uh, of the role of the intelligentsia in the basic mass movements. 
So these are the mass movements that uh, provide the foundation of the legal democratic movement in the Philippines. Then there are two more parts. One is the legal electoral struggle, uh, which is a, strat a strategy of the legal democratic movement. Meaning to say, uh, the, le the legal democratic movement conducts dual tactics, meaning to say, on one hand, you have militant mass campaigns by the mass movements, but on the other hand, these mass organizations participate in electoral struggle uh, to present the issues of the people to expose the sham parliament, but at the same time, you use the parliament so that you bring up the issues of the workers, the peasants, and others. And this is the particularity in the Philippine movement because these dual tactics uh, are able to uh, combine the opportunities and advantages in the, in the, of the mass movement and at the same time of electoral struggle. And that is why you have Bayan Muna, which is a partyless system in the Philippines, but Bayan Muna was created by Bayan, which is the alliance of mass movements in the Philippines. You have the Gabriela Women's Party. You have the Anakpawis for the peasants and the workers. You have the ACT party list also of the teachers and the Kabataan party list all these party lists are able to take advantage of positions in government, in the Congress, not because we want to make the Congress uh, pass good laws, but actually to show that a landlord, comprador dominated Congress actually cannot fulfill the demands of the people. But by presenting the people's demands, it becomes then uh, um, a forum to expose the ruling system of the Philippines. And at the same time, you take advantage of what opportunities are there to, to advance the, um, the interests of the demands uh, of the people. The third area that is uh, for the uh, uh, legal democratic movement is a broad united front. In this, uh, the broad united front is where the legal, the democratic forces, the mass movement, the party lists link with reactionary parties in tactical alliance. And therefore, the broad united front is a mechanism for tactical alliance with uh, elements of the ruling class, like the Liberal Party or uh, the uh, representatives of the Social Democrats and others. And the, the broad United Front is important to expose further the narrowest target of the ruling system in the Philippines, which is the state headed by the US Duterte government. Therefore, for us, uh, it is important that we, uh, we conduct uh, um, a tactical ally, uh, anal alliances to, to isolate the main puppet of US uh, imperialism. For example, we can have alliances that are issue focused. Uh, an issue focused alliance could be, let's say, the issue of uh, the burial of Marcos. It's issue focused. And we conducted tactical, a broad tactical alliance on that issue. The question of the, the movement against tyranny 
is another issue focus, but it's a bit broader because it was now directed against uh, Duterte. So altogether, you have the broad mass movement of the democratic forces. You have a broad anti-imperialist movement, which is expressed in the participation uh, in ILPS and for example, the ILPS Philippines. And so also the, uh, the uh, campaigns uh, regarding uh, the, the fight between China and the US two imperialist powers on the Philippines. And you also have the broad anti-fascist movement, which is expressed in the uh, movement against tyranny. But at the same time, it is now expressed in the context of the fight uh, in the elections. And that's where the, the one aspect is because you have electoral struggle, but as part of the, um, the legal democratic movement. So that electoral tactics now means you now have alliances with uh, reactionary parties and where you can uh, push certain demands and at the same time also uh, isolate the, uh, the, the Duterte uh, camp. This uh, last year of the, of the term of Duterte is going to be critical in many ways. Uh, the US has given Duterte one, uh, you know, one year left. To, uh, to attack the, the legal democratic movement, as well as uh, to end the people's war launched by the National Democratic Front. But at the same time, as Duterte ends his term, and the fact that there has, we, uh, the legal democratic movement, along with its solidarity allies, were able to isolate Duterte, that Duterte now ha is facing investigation and in the International Criminal Court. So Duterte now is facing a big quandary on how to contain, to continue his term and how he will now address the charges against him. In, in the, coming election and at the same time, the upcoming uh, continuing efforts of the military and fascist terror against the legal democratic movement, then there is a need now to an effective for uh, to, to develop effective tactical alliances. One, to draw the broad participation of different progressive forces, but that at the same time to conduct tactical alliance with reactionary parties. In the end, the important thing is how do we uh, disrupt the ruling system in the context of the election, but at the same time, how do we conduct uh, dual tactics in the legal democratic movement, advancing the demands of the workers, the peasants, the youth and other se democratic sectors of, of society, but at the same time, uh, bringing the, the revolution closer to victory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Tuhan, for that discussion on the legal democratic movement in the Philippines. As Sir Tuhan explained, such a movement operates principally in the urban areas. It is, however, only secondary to the people's democratic revolution against imperialism, feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism. Still though, uh, I, I believe Sir Tuhan emphasizes the very important role of the legal democratic movement in arousing organizing and mobilizing the masses. 
Sir Tuhan actually also highlights the need to push back against the attack to legal organizations who are supporting uh, the democratic, uh, the national democratic movement in the Philippines. However, out of the many components he enumerated earlier, I think we all find alliance work very interesting, especially given that the national elections in the Philippines is coming. And so maybe we could ask Sir Tuhan to discuss further the electoral struggle and about dual tactics later on during our open forum. And to our webinar participants who are interested in asking questions or who want to share their comments about the presentation, you may do so by clicking the Q&A button on your Zoom screens. And if you're viewing this webinar from the Facebook Live on the ILPS page, you may also comment your questions on the Facebook Live video. We have seen some questions already, so thank you very much to our very active participants. And we will get to your questions and comments later on during our open forum. I would also like to thank our translators for their valuable role in helping us bridge and bring our message to our allies and compatriots from other countries. Please note that the ILPS website has a webinar library and we will be posting this webinar and other necessary materials there on our website. Without further ado, our next speaker is a Filipino teacher, revolutionary, and internationalist. He is the chair of the International Network for Philippine Studies and is chairperson emeritus of the ILPS. Let us all welcome Professor Jose Maria Sison. Huh. Dear colleagues and friends, uh, warmest greetings of uh, solidarity to all of you in whichever time zone you are. I wish to thank the leading committee and member organizations of the Philippine chapter of the International League of People's Struggle for inviting me to be one of the speakers in the third part of the educational webinar series on the national democratic struggle in the Philippines. I agree with the declared objectives of the webinar series. The first part on September 11 was on understanding the roots of the crisis of semi-colonial and semi-feudal Philippines. And the second part on September 25 was on imperialism in a multipolar world. Where does the Philippines stand? Today, the third part is on the Filipino people's struggle for national and social liberation development and lasting peace. I'm assigned to discuss the short-term and long-term prospects of the national and social liberation movement in the Philippines. I propose that two thirds of my speech are on the prospects, but I shall use the first one third of the speech to discuss the current conditions that favor the struggle for national and social liberation to lay the basis for the prognosis. The persistent semi-colonial and semi-feudal ruling system, which is dominated by foreign monopoly capitalism and directly run by the comprador big bourgeoisie, the landlord <clears throat> class, and the bureaucrat capitalist, is an ever-worsening chronic crisis. The escalating conditions of exploitation and oppression drive the people to assert and fight for the national and democratic rights and interests. Since the end of the Marcos fascist dictatorship, the revolutionary forces and people led by the Communist Party have been willing to engage in peace negotiations in order to confront the basic <coughs> problems of the Filipino people, such as imperialism, domestic feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism, which are the roots uh, of the Civil Cison? War. Professor Sison, excuse me. May we respect? Uh, uh, may we ask you to speak a bit slower for the sake of our translators, Professor? Thank you. If you could speak a bit slower, sir, for our translators, because they are able to a bit slower. Yes, yes. Ah, yeah. I will uh, speak more slowly. Um, so we can start from. Uh, the beginning of the paragraph. Since the end of the Marcos fascist dictatorship, 
the revolutionary forces and people led by the Communist Party of the Philippines have been willing to engage in peace negotiations in order to confront the basic problems of the Filipino people, such as imperialism, domestic feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism, which are the roots of the civil war, and to work out comprehensive agreements on social, economic, and political reforms as the basis for a just and lasting peace between the belligerent forces. But under every post-Marcos regime, the ruling reactionaries followed the pattern of pretending to be for peace negotiations and eventually bowing to US imperialism and to the pro-US reactionary armed forces as objectors to the further progress of the peace negotiations. The Ramos regime seemed to be truly interested in the peace negotiations because it agreed to the Hague Joint Declaration of 1992 as the basic framework of peace negotiations and several other major agreements, but failed to sign the Comprehensive Agreement on Respect for Human Rights and International Humanitarian Law already initialed in 1996 by the GRP and NDFP negotiating panels. The worst of the post-Marcos regimes is the current one of Duterte, after promising in the 2016 presidential elections that he would amnesty all political prisoners and negotiate a peace agreement. But in less than a year, it became evident that he was out to sabotage and terminate the GRP and the FP peace negotiations in order to scapegoat the CPP and the NPA and use state terrorism in the style of Marcos to pursue his own ambition of fascist dictatorship. He continued Aquino's Oplan Bayanihan until he adopted his own Oplan Kapayapaan in January 2017. On May 23, 2017, he included the CPP and NPA as targets of martial rule in Mindanao. On November 23, 2017, after talking to uh, personally to uh, US President Trump, he formally terminated the peace negotiations. On December 5, 2017, he designated the CPP and NPA as terrorist organizations. He launched focus military operations against the revolutionary forces and mass base in certain regions. And on December 4, 2018, he created the National Task Force, ELCAC, to red tag social activists, peace advocates, human rights defenders, and target them for abduction, torture, and murder. He applied against them the same brutal methods applied in the bogus war on drugs. Since then, the Duterte regime has increasingly manifested its character as traitorous, tyrannical, addicted to extrajudicial killings, and obsessed with plunder. He has acted as the puppet to US imperialism in order to obtain advice and weapons for the armed counter-revolution as well as the Chinese imperialism in order to sell out Philippine sovereign and maritime rights over the West Philippine Sea and to seek personal benefit from lopsided loan agreements and construction and supply contracts and from the smuggling out of mineral ores to China and smuggling in of illegal drugs, rice and other commodities and from gambling operations and human trafficking by Chinese criminal syndicates. Under the brutal and corrupt Duterte regime, the semi-colonial and semi-feudal conditions have become far worse than ever before. The exploitation and oppression of the toiling masses of workers and peasants have escalated as never before. Unemployment, low incomes, destruction of livelihoods and mass poverty are rampant while inflation is raging. When Duterte became president in 2016, the public debt was 5.9 trillion pesos 
incurred by all previous governments since 1902. Now, it is uh, 11.6 trillion pesos and will be more than uh, 13 trillion next year, more than the double in one presidential term of six years. Under the neoliberal policy, the regime has wasted limit, uh, limited resources and rising local and public debt through unbridled bureaucratic corruption and profligacy, military overspending at the expense of social services uh, like education, health, uh, housing, and so on, depressed production in agriculture and manufacturing in favor of the big compradors and their foreign principles, debt-fueled and import-dependent consumption and rising debt burden due to huge budgetary and trade deficits. The debt bubble is unsustainable and is about to burst or is already bursting. The global crisis that began with the 2008 financial meltdown was by end of 2019 again taking a steep fall when COVID-19 began to spread worldwide pushing more than one third of all countries to go into general lockdowns. This served to ensure what is widely perceived as the start of a great depression, even worse than that of 1929 onward. The Philippines being heavily dependent on the global capitalist system is now drowning in a tsunami of collapsing international trade and supply chains capital flows and labor markets. By early 2020, the country began to feel the impacts of this global tsunami in terms of the sudden drying up of overseas jobs and tourist arrivals. The chronic crisis of the ruling system was already rapidly worsening when the COVID-19 pandemic hit the country in early 2020 due to the regime's earlier decision in November 2019 to continue the influx of tourists, especially half a million Chinese tourists and casino players. Duterte has taken advantage of the pandemic by pressing Congress to give additional powers to the executive, especially to his narrow militarist clique masquerading as an interagency task force against emerging infectious diseases. He then used these powers to short circuit regular governmental processes, tightly control people's movements and other civil rights through lockdowns, realign already budgeted funds, supposedly for mass testing, medical treatment and economic assistance to the people severely affected by the lockdowns and then siphon massive amounts of funds in tens and hundreds of billions of pesos into his own pocket and those of his gangmates by overpricing and faking purchases of supplies. This hijacking of public funds and loans surpasses any robbery done previously in the history of puppet presidents. Duterte has also used the pandemic and the extreme lockdown restrictions to railroad the Anti-Terror Act of 2020, which is a license for state terrorism. This is a key move in a scheme to realize a fascist dictatorship. And the retired and active generals he has been corrupting and using to promote fascism and militarize the civilian departments and agencies of the reactionary government are happy to have a law of state terrorism in order to commit atrocities freely against the people and steal from them larger amounts of public money under such pretexts as enhanced comprehensive local integration a program or ECLIP, community support projects and barangay development program. They have the notion that they can defeat the revolutionary movement of the people by blaming it for the underdevelopment, mass poverty, oppression, and exploitation done by the imperialists and the local exploiting classes, 
by offering palliatives and false promises of development, by unleashing state terrorism and military campaigns of suppression, and by facilitating land grabbing by bureaucrat capitalists and domestic and foreign owners of logging, mining, plantation companies, as well as real estate development companies. But the reactionary armed forces, police, and paramilitary units are never enough to terrorize and control the 111 million Filipino people and the highly motivated revolutionary forces, especially the People's Army that is skillfully waging the People's War. Duterte and his armed minions boast from month to month that they can totally destroy the revolutionary movement of the people by using these programs in combination with focused military operations. But in fact, they steal most of the funds by faking lists of NPA surrenderers and death casualties, faking intelligence, psy war and combat operations, and by faking community development projects. The open rule of terror, as previously exercised by Marcos from 1972 to 1986, failed to destroy the armed revolution and only succeeded in generating the conditions for its nationwide expansion, especially among the toiling masses of workers and peasants and the intelligentsia. The Marcos path of state terrorism is the same path of failure that Duterte has taken. There is no way that the Duterte regime can destroy the revolutionary movement. The rapidly worsening conditions of oppression and exploitation are driving the people to carry out various forms of struggle for national and social liberation in both cities and the countryside. The legal forms of mass struggles in the cities have been irrepressible, and the rural-based armed revolution is even far more difficult to suppress because the CPP and NPA are using the strategy and tactics of protracted people's war to carry out the people's democratic revolution. In both cities and countryside, there is no way for the enemy to stop the time-tested processes of recruiting, training, and deploying people as cadres and members of the CPP, NPA, the mass organizations, alliances, and local organs of political or people's democratic power, the enemy would have to kill so many non-communists before it can kill one communist. The indiscriminate abductions and murders being done by the enemy are futile and have succeeded only to goad the revolutionary forces to increase their ranks from the millions of oppressed and exploited masses. Enemies and detractors of the People's Democratic Revolution led by the CPP have maliciously claimed that it is already a proven futile project by failing to seize political power in Manila during the last 52 years. We must recognize that the CPP has scored a great achievement in defeating so many campaigns to destroy it and has succeeded in building itself the NPA, revolutionary mass organizations, alliances, and the local organs of political power constituting the people's democratic government on a nationwide scale in an archipelago on a self-reliant basis and without the advantages of cross-border connections with any socialist bulwark that the Chinese and Indo-Chinese revolutionaries had during and after World War II. We can be certain that the Duterte regime will not be able to destroy the armed revolutionary movement before the 2022 presidential elections, but it keeps on drumming up the Tsai War line that it will be able to do so before the end of 2021 or 2022 to try to deceive the people and persuade the US to support the continuance of Duterte's power through a stooge. We are certain that the social, economic, and political crisis of the ruling system will deteriorate faster than ever before, will rouse the broad masses of the people, 
and the organized forces of the National Democratic Movement and the conservative opposition to intensify mass protest and will isolate the Duterte regime. The more notorious Duterte uh, has become due to the grave crimes and the grave deterioration of the economic and social conditions, the more he is touted as extremely popular by paid poll survey firms, radio broadcasts, troll armies in social media, and many local and foreign corporate mass media. This phenomenon is the result of the fear factor and deference to authority, not only among the deprived and insecure masses, but also among members of the exploiting classes who are protective of their interests and are afraid of Duterte's vindictiveness. But it's in the time of Marcos from 1982 to 1986, the reality of the escalating conditions of oppression and exploitation and the rapid discredit and isolation of Duterte is increasingly crying out louder than the propaganda churned out by the regime and its, and its agents. Right now, the Duterte ruling clique is a target of public outrage and mass struggles because of its betrayal of the people by personally profiting from relations with the Chinese state and criminal triads, the rampancy of illegal drugs under the dominance of the Duterte crime family, the unprecedentedly high proportions of plunder by Duterte, his business cronies and favorite generals before and during COVID-19, his notorious alliance with his predecessors in plunder, like the Marcoses, Arroyos, and others, widespread corruption among the high bureaucrats and military officials, and the extrajudicial killings, and other atrocities perpetrated in the bogus war on drugs and in the armed counter-revolution. The Duterte policy and campaigns of state terrorism characterized by abductions, torture, and mass murders, take over of civilian functions by the reactionary armed forces, and widespread daily acts of systematic abuse against the masses in the guise of strict enforcement of health protocols, inflicting intolerable suffering on the people, driving them to join the various forms of resistance and impelling some of the people who have relatives in the reactionary, military police and paramilitary forces to turn against the Duterte ruling clique as the chief oppressor and exploiter of the people. Even among the armed minions of the Duterte regime, there is a system of favoritism, corruption, and bullying at the expense of the lower officers and enlisted personnel. There are manifestations of the structure of Duterte loyalists cracking up at a faster rate, even if for a while Duterte tried to use his propaganda machinery to conjure the illusion that he is immune to the usual phenomenon of a sitting president becoming a lame duck in his last year, and his a blessing for his chosen successor is a kiss of death. He rigged the 2019 midterm elections to gain control of both houses of Congress and to strengthen his clique's hold on local governments. But in the Senate, some of his key apologists in the recent past are now active in exposing the extreme cases of corruption in which Duterte and his cronies are directly involved. Certain governors and mayors have also become bolder in their own assertions of local authority against the worst of Duterte's arbitrary impositions, whether related or not to their own plans in the approaching 2022 elections. These are clear cut signals to the electorate and the opposition that they have begun to be more vocal in their own anti-Duterte criticism and to distance themselves from his narrow clique. It is a source of widespread speculation whether the current exposés in the Senate of Duterte's corruption and cronyism, cronyism, the intensified campaign of religious leaders to denounce his crimes, the growing clamor among certain business groups 
against Duterte's extreme favoritism and arbitrary impositions amid the bankrupt economy and the decision of the internal, International Criminal Court to investigate the extrajudicial killings in the bogus war on drugs are definite indications that major domestic and international forces, which he used to ignore or make fun of, are now determined to junk him as an intolerable liability to the entire ruling system. Many people are still wondering why there are yet no clear signals from the US authorities that they cannot take the risk of letting Duterte continue his rule through his daughter or another stooge and allow China to acquire more advantages in the Philippines. And there is yet no sustained campaign by retired generals to expose Duterte's crimes and prepare the active disgruntled officers of the reactionary armed forces and police to express their rejection of a commander in chief who has betrayed their trust. In contrast, uh, China, the Chinese cronies directly around Duterte and the Chinese criminal triads in the business of casinos and smuggling continue to support Duterte for their own purposes. The biggest gains made by China under the Duterte regime include its successful building of artificial islands as military bases in the West Philippine Sea. Control of its marine and mineral resources worth so many trillions of dollars. Control of the national power grid, insertion of cell towers in AFP military camps, and smuggling out of mineral ores from open pit mines all over the archipelago. China and Chinese private interests can easily put their money on the Duterte slate in the forthcoming 2022 elections. In the meantime, the Duterte ruling clique appears to be confident of retaining US support, if only because Duterte is still useful in the bloody counter-revolution. It still appears that he can continue to use to his advantage his incumbency as president, the bureaucracy and the military machinery, the relentless flow of his press releases to the corporate media and black propaganda campaigns of his troll army. And most important of all, with regard to the 2022 presidential elections, there is yet no visible effective counter to his complete control of the Comelec and um, uh, TIM Smartmatic. Not even a non-frail type of independent body with a, with a mass-based network has arisen with legal authority to mirror instantly the Comelec vote count from the precinct level upward. The Sam, Sambayan has, uh, has already taken the initiative to put forward the line that there must be one presidential candidate to challenge uh, the candidate put up by the Duterte dynasty and thus facilitate the electoral victory of the opposition candidate like uh, Cory Aquino did in 1986 against Marcos and generate a mass uprising to topple the fake victory of the Duterte uh, uh, candidate. Uh, um, the recent development in Isasambayan is that uh, Lenny Rubero has already been chosen as the presidential uh, standard bearer. Uh, indeed, if there would be three or more presidential candidates, it would be easier for the beneficiary of the Duterte's rigging, um, the 2022 presidential elections, to claim that the op opposition lost because it had split its votes. It is widely presumed that Duterte is confident of being able to rig the 2022 presidential elections and does not have to take the high risk of uh, proclaiming a revolutionary government, so-called, even though some of those who were his previous uh, sycophants in uh, Congress have become disgruntled or have been rejected by him. Nevertheless, all patriotic and democratic forces must be vigilant and be ready to fight any attempt of Duterte to impose a fascist dictatorship through the proclamation of um, 
nationwide martial rule and the use of the um, Anti-Terrorism Act to carry out mass arrests and mass murders. According to sources close to Duterte, he retains the option of either rigging the 2022 presidential elections or proclaiming nationwide martial law in order to retain power and prevent his arrest either by order of the International Criminal Court for the extrajudicial killings in the bogus war on drugs, the Philippine courts for charges of corruption now being exposed in the Senate, or the People's Court of the People's Revolutionary Government for all the grave crimes that he has committed. He is uncertain whether he can escape to China or any other country in order to avoid arrest. The imminent possibility of a prolonged COVID-19 pandemic and failures in the mass vaccination strategy, a new financial meltdown or major outbreaks of social unrest have their own dynamic, which could greatly impact the short-term political and socioeconomic conditions in the Philippines. This may include change priority levels uh, that the US and China as two imperialist powers with uh, major Philippine stakes may give to the 2022 presidential elections. For instance, should the COVID emergency in the country extend to the 2022 election period, the incumbent Duterte regime and its candidates will definitely take advantage of their power to rig the vote count from the precinct level to the national level. They can use their authority to impose local lockdowns, restrictions on mass gatherings, relief and vaccine deliveries as carrot and stick, control of media airtime, special COMELEC and police powers and so on. In any case, the National Democratic Movement and the conservative opposition are obliged to form a broad united front against the Duterte ruling clique to denounce its gross and systematic crimes against the people and to prepare against the immediate prospect of Duterte's rigging of the 2022 presidential elections. Such a broad united front can allow the national democratic mass movement to continue calling for the ouster of the Duterte regime. The possibility of ouster can gain reality only when Duterte loses control of his own reactionary armed forces and police, as Marcos did in 1986 and Estrada in 2001. It is not an idle exercise in futility for the National Democratic Movement to keep on calling for the ouster of the Duterte regime. The call can help to intensify the people's hatred for the crimes of the Duterte regime and to step up the efforts of the broad popular movement to oust Duterte. Without such call, the possibility of ouster before or after the presidential elections is given up in advance. Such a call of the National Democratic Movement and the broad United Front must result in large and sustained mass struggles of the workers, peasants, and other progressive sectors and their millions on a nationwide scale. It can also be inspiring to the people in their revolutionary armed struggle for national and social liberation. In the coming years from 2022 to 2028, if it is necessary for the Filipino people and their revolutionary forces to wage the armed revolution, they will have excellent conditions and opportunities for bringing about the maturation of the advanced phase of the stage of strategic defensive in the People's War and the beginnings of the strategic stalemate in certain provinces and regions. We are assuming that despite current enemy campaigns of oppression, the CPP and NPA will further excel at carrying out the strategy and tactics of guerrilla warfare on the basis of an ever-growing and deepening mass base and that the crisis of both the domestic ruling system and the world capitalist system will continue to worsen. If the Duterte ruling clique continues to rule the people by rigging the 20, 
22 presidential elections, the patriotic and democratic forces must arouse, organize, and mobilize the people to rise up to topple the usurper of power in the same manner as Marcos was removed from power in 1986. If that were not immediately possible, then the people have to proceed to continue the struggle for some longer time, even if only to oust the fake president. We must recall that the 1986 snap elections and people's uprising were preceded by more than two years of gigantic and sustained nationwide mass campaigns, united front developments such as uh, um, justice for Aquino and justice for all, um, the um, accord, the national alliance for justice, freedom and democracy, and the people's congresses of Bayan and Compil and major street mobilizations will peak uh, with peak strength in the hundreds of thousands of participants in major cities from the 1983 Aquino assassination onward. The extension of the power of the Duterte ruling clique cannot last very long because Duterte has, has already bankrupted the economy and the reactionary government and the broad masses of the people cannot tolerate for a long while a ruling clique that is extremely detestable because of its crimes of treason, tyranny, mass murder, plunder, and swindling. The longer such a clique remains in power, the faster will all forms of revolutionary struggle develop and advance against the entire ruling system. Even an opposition presidential candidate wins, it is possible that he or she will stand or pose for a while as a patriotic and democratic opposite of Duterte and will probably offer the resumption of peace negotiations to the National Democratic Front of the Philippines. Such a new president has to come on top of the crisis that, du that the Duterte ruling clique has so extremely aggravated and there is the need for the broadest possible national unity to address the roots of the armed conflict and achieve a just and lasting peace. In this case, the peace negotiations can be resumed by reaffirming all previous agreements and improving the safety and immunity guarantees for the negotiators, consultants, resource persons, and staff of the two negotiating panels. But it is also possible for the winning opposition candidate to accept the dictates of U.S. imperialism and pro-U.S. military officers to continue the campaign of Duterte to destroy the revolutionary movement or to pretend to engage in peace negotiations, but only to seek the capitulation of the revolutionary movement. The Filipino people and the revolutionary forces must therefore be ready to continue the revolutionary armed struggle without any let up. If there are peace negotiations, but the reactionary government turns out to have no serious interest in attaining a justice, then the NDFP can disengage anytime from such a waste of time. The recrudescence of the Marcos fascist dictatorship in the form of the Duterte state terrorism with worse forms of mass murder and corruption proves the decadent and moribund character of the semi-colonial and semi-feudal ruling system. There may be regimes that pose as bourgeois democratic, like the ones from Aquino, the mother to Aquino, the son, but they will continue to perpetrate the daily violence of exploitation and military campaigns of suppression against the toiling masses of workers and peasants and the revolution. The compelling reasons for the revolutionary movement will continue. The multiplication of guerrilla platoons and companies, an increase of guerrilla fronts on a nationwide scale, and the continuance, continuance of extensive and intensive guerrilla warfare will characterize the strategic defensive stage of the people, of the people's war, from the middle phase to the maturation of the advanced phase. The platoons will continue to develop localized stalemates with the local police forces in many towns and the viability of organic companies in many guerrilla fronts in many provinces and regions 
will indicate the advance towards the stage of the strategic stalemate. The further advance from the strategic stalemate to the strategic offensive will be relatively fast, but it is too early to dwell on it now in this webinar. The enemy will continue to be unable to stop the expansion and consolidation of the CPP, the NPA, the revolutionary mass organizations, alliances, and the local organs of democratic political power. The CPP will expand and consolidate its ranks in both cities and countryside. The NPA will develop its forces in the guerrilla fronts and expand towards the urban areas. The revolutionary mass organization will expand and consolidate even faster than the CPP and NPA. The, the alliances will expand their constituents and influence and the local organs of democratic power will multiply at the grassroots and will develop uh, to higher levels of self-government. The conditions for the people's democratic revolution through protracted people's war will become more favorable. Within the Philippines, the reactionary state will become more unable to control the various armed organizations of the Moro people and other national minorities whose continuing struggle shall benefit from the advance of the revolutionary forces led by the CPP. The latter will in turn benefit from the advance of the armed struggle of the national minorities. The People's Democratic Revolution shall be basically completed upon the seizure of political power and the establishment of the People's Democratic Republic under the leadership of the CPP and the proletariat. This shall mark the start of the socialist revolution with all the transitory measures. The National United Front shall be maintained and further developed to ensure the fulfillment of the remaining tasks of the new democratic revolution and the success of socialist revolution and construction. The commanding heights of the economy shall be socialized. Land reform shall be completed and agricultural cooperatives will advance from one level to a higher one. National industrialization shall be carried out by the socialist state and the patriotic sectors. A national scientific and mass culture shall thrive. Foreign relations shall be based on independence, friendship, equality, and cooperation, and shall serve the purpose of development and peace against imperialism and all reaction. The worsening crisis of the world capitalist system will aggravate the crisis of the domestic ruling system and the advance of revolutionary movements in anti-imperialist and socialist states abroad will favor the advance of the Philippine Revolution. At the same time, the Philippine Revolution will contribute to the advance of the revolutionary movements and anti-imperialist and socialist states abroad. It is of particular significance for those who are interested in the Philippine Revolution's medium-term and long-term prospects to analyze and monitor more closely the frequent convulsions of the global capitalist crisis, uh, the worldwide resurgence of the anti-imperialist and democratic movements, and the fast worsening rivalries among the imperialist powers, especially between the US and China. The Philippines and neighboring countries in Southeast Asia lie in a long belt of flashpoints in the worsening US-China rivalry. And every major tremor in this region may produce twists and turns in the country's socioeconomic and political situation, including possible realignments among the factions of the exploiting classes. Such developments will provide the Philippine National Democratic Movement with more opportunities for it to advance solidarity work and participate in a broad united front along the anti-imperialist and democratic line. The international relations of the Philippine revolutionary movement adhere to the principle of proletarian internationalism among the communist and workers parties. The international solidarity of peoples and the international united front of all anti-imperialist and democratic forces. In the course of the People's Democratic Revolution, the revolutionary forces of the Filipino people 
develop mutual understanding and cooperation with corresponding forces abroad, such relations shall develop further in the course of socialist revolution and construction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sison, for your speech on the prospects of the social liberation movement in the Philippines. Not only did he emphasize the role of the legal democratic movement in forwarding the people's agenda in the parliamentary arena, he was also able to expound on some prospects on the 2022 elections and future negotiations in the Philippines on just and lasting peace. Professor Sison also highlighted the, uh, the conditions in the last five years that necessitate the broad united front in the Philippines today. These include neoliberal policies, economic failures, uh, bubbling debt, land grabbing, and vital bureaucratic corruption and the privatization of uh, public social services. I also think that we can glean from this, from this discussion how the failure of the COVID-19 pandemic response in the Philippines cannot be separated from the discontents of imperialism. And as Professor Sison points out, the mass struggle and revolutionary forces in both urban and rural arenas are still insuppressible. The campaigns of the organs of people's power continue to bring down the state's anti-people crusades and isolate the Duterte regime. At this point, we reiterate our call and the U.S. Duterte regime. We'd also like to thank all of our participants. Thank you for listening intently to our speakers. We are now currently live on the ILTS Facebook page. If you have any questions addressed to our speakers, please comment them on the live stream video for Facebook viewers and in the Q&A box for, uh, for our Zoom participants. We will be addressing them in the open forum section later on, which will be happening in a, in a, in a few minutes. No? We also request that uh, you introduce yourselves along with your questions as we would during face-to-face -face avenues. But for now, we will be having a short five-minute break. While on break, we will be playing a music video for the song Lakbayan, or in translation, The People's Political Sojourn by the band General Strike. Thank you and see you in a few.
Hi again, everyone, and welcome back to our webinar entitled People's Struggle for National and Social Liberation, Development, and Lasting Peace. At this point, we are officially opening our open forum. We will be addressing the questions that were shared through the chat box or through the Facebook live stream comments. And now, without further ado, for our first question, this question is uh, addressed to Professor Sison. Given the recent developments, such as the announcement of Duterte retiring from politics, the submission of Bongo as vice president, and Sara Duterte as mayor of Davao, what should the people and the democratic forces expect or prepare for in the coming months as the election race heats up? Especially since Duterte mentioned that he would deploy the military and police to ensure peaceful elections. And since these elections are important to both sides in the escalating U.S.-China conflict. This is a question from uh, Mr. Antonio Valiente and addressed to Professor Cesar. Uh, you know, Duterte is a great uh, kind of pretender, no? If you review his uh, acting, his um, uh, arte arte in uh, 2015, did, did he announce that he was already withdrawing from the presidential race? And but uh, uh, in the end, uh, even uh, uh, for quite some time, um, he would uh, keep up that pretense until you know he there was a switching, a substitution process done, uh, so he would run, be able to run as president. Well, there is a report that Sarah has already filed her candidacy also as uh, mayor, no? but I think he can she can easily substitute. Eh? Um, uh, he, uh, for uh, uh, Bongo, and then Duterte can uh, can stay on. We have to find out whether Duterte has really uh, given up his uh, um, his uh, vice presidential plan. Uh, you know, the the two, uh, the father, the the daughter and father have been shamed huh, by their appearance as extremely greedy. Huh? I I call the tandem of uh, the uh, of the Duterte uh, daughter and father as a greedy huh? a greedy tandem because you know <laughs> the the two slots are usually reserved for candidates from different regions in order to uh, broaden the, the, the base of, of support. But uh, in this case, the Duterte, Duterte tandem uh, exposes how, how greedy this dynasty is. You know? So uh, they're going into a lot of acting. And you know, the plan A, you must be, it must be, be clear, the plan A of Duterte is to control and rig the 2022 elections. He's confident about that. But, and I hope he, he continues his uh, uh, confidence in being able to rig the elections because that may discourage him from uh, proclaiming martial law. That's his plan B. He still, you know, he can create incidents huh? um, to, in order to justify um, uh, the proclamation of nationwide uh, martial law like Marcos did no, in September uh, uh, 1972. So um, Duterte is a very slippery and um, uh, clever player. Uh, you, uh, you investigate how he pretended to be left and socialist how he cooperated with the uh, revolutionary forces for so many, many years in southern, in uh, the Davao region. But he would be the one to tip off. Eh? While Aquino was president, he was able to tip off uh, Año, eh? where Parago was uh, um, convalescing from his illness. No? That's how traitorous he is. He's a big traitor. And uh, the left has learned a big lesson uh, from the, that character of Duterte as a big traitor. So I think uh, the people must be ready for Duterte's plan A and plan B, and they must see through, you know, his uh, acting, you know. He's a, you know, if you know already his background of acting, he comes out as a, a lousy actor, no? Um, probably Pacquiao can, um, can, uh, can be a more uh, successful uh, actor, no? Uh, uh, he tried acting aside from singing. Uh, Duterte uh, is already uh, 
a well-proven liar and a pretender. So, <laughs> okay, that answers the Thank question you. sufficiently. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Season. Indeed, uh, we need to remain wary of the Tertes thirst and grasp for power. Uh, for those who are raising their hands, may we please request that you input your questions uh, through our Q&A box uh, through the Zoom, right? Uh, and then for those who are already asking questions, please indicate your name as we prefer, as we, as we do not prefer anonymous questions. Uh, all right, let's move on to the next one. This question is addressed to Sir Antonio Tuhan. In other countries, there have been widespread protest actions even amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet here in the Philippines, there has been hesitance on ground for large mobilizations, even amongst the organized legal democratic forces due to health concerns. Since the 2022 national budget has cut basic social services, including health, it seems as if the pandemic here in the Philippines will only worsen. What do you think will be the key to getting the tens or even uh, thousands of people to, uh, of, of those part of the legal democratic movement into the streets? Are there lessons to be learned from movements abroad? And if so, what are they? Sir Tuhan. Thank you. Um, it, should be, uh, it should be remembered that um, the lockdowns were particularly harsh only in China and the Philippines. So when you have a lockdown of that kind where um, people are not allowed to go out, they're not allowed to go to work, they're not going out to out of the house at all, then it creates uh, a tremendous impact on families and communities. So that's one. Number two, the lockdown in the Philippines was more harsh than in China uh, because it was extended. And it was implemented in a, an even more fascist way than in China. Remember the cases where people were actually manhandled, uh, some people were shot or killed uh, because of violating uh, restrictions, which means to say there is the element of uh, a fascist control that was used in the Philippines, which has never happened at that scale in other countries. You'll notice, for example, in, in uh, India, when they tried to implement a lockdown, you find that some, uh, some, uh, in some poor communities, actually uh, the, the community people fought the police because they, they, uh, they didn't want a lockdown and they had a problem implementing the lockdown in, in India. But in the Philippines, uh, there was a, a combination of one, a fascist terror, the ATL was there, and then you have the lockdown. With the lockdown, there are no schools. So how do you mobilize the students? The workers, uh, some of them uh, uh, closed down, closed shop or uh, in the service sector. And then in the communities, you'll find also uh, an impact of the lockdown, even in the communities. And that's the reason why uh, the expectation that there should be uh, in the Philippines, uh, I think uh, should be understood in the context of the lockdown where the Duterte government used the COVID to, uh, uh, to, to, to strengthen its fascist attack on, on opposition, uh, uh, on dissent. Now, um, on the other hand, if you look at in some countries where the lockdowns in the first place were not that uh, severe, I mean, you don't have a real lockdown in, let's say in Europe, you, you, they call it a lockdown, but in reality, people were allowed to go out. The only lockdown, it only means that lockdown means is that the hotels and the bars and the restaurants are closed down. That's what it means, and um, and then you 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 have 
precautions and so on. And you don't have, uh, um, let's say, um, how do you call this, um, uh, checkpoints that prevent movement of people in Europe. So therefore, uh, there have been uh, a lot of protests against COVID restrictions from anarchist groups, from spontaneous, uh, uh, you know, uh, spontaneous uh, uh, actions, even from the youth and so on. And, and that should not be, uh, and therefore there is a, a real difference, if you will. Now, if we're looking at the question, are, are we looking at a tipping point? Are we looking at the possibility of spontaneous action? The, there's, um, it, really, it really combines now the question with the question of elections, meaning to say that some people will feel that since there's going to be elections anyway, there's no point to, to you know, to, to to uh, do something, let's just uh, use your vote. On the other hand, uh, as the elections open up the space, it also opens the space for more actions. And uh, I expect that there will be some that's uh, coming in the, in the following months. Thank you so much, Sir Tuhan pointing out such comparisons and uh, opening up uh, possible prospects regarding the elections and possible uh, mass actions. Now, for the next question, uh, I, I think uh, any or both of our speakers could respond to this one. This is from an anonymous uh, participant. What are recent examples of successful liberation movements? And what lessons can we learn from other national liberation movements? So this is open for both or any of our speakers. Can I can start? Uh, Joma will follow. Right. Uh, I would just like to emphasize that we have to remember that there was imperialist triumphalism with the collapse of the Soviet Union. That triumphalism in the early 90s meant that number one, uh, they created the notion, the end of history. Number two, they considered national liberation movements no longer as legitimate. And in the UN, liberation movements were considered non-state actors, which means to say you are passé because there's no, uh, you know, an end of history. Class struggle is no longer there. Because of that, there was also part of that triumphalism was the attack that was launched by the US on the so-called rogue states and liberation movements. So from uh, the, the last uh, decade of the century and the two more decades this century, you'll find the attack of, you know, of uh, progressive movements in the Middle East, including the attack of, uh, the Saddam's uh, Iraq, the uh, attack of Libya and others, because precisely uh, Libya, uh, Syria, and others were 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 uh, supported, uh, were I don't know, uh, accused of supporting liberation movements. So it's a double whammy, if you will, by imperialism. There was uh, a real aggression, and in in. Uh, intensification of aggression after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that's the reason why Venezuela, Cuba, and so on are subject to sanctions and so on. So it's not as though that we should be saying that there should be liberation movements. Indeed, there's still liberation movements. The fact that the liberation movement in the Philippines and Colombia and others were, be, were able to persevere despite the imperialist uh, triumphalism is already something, and therefore it is, it is up to us to 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 demand why there was no examples. Because precisely for the past thirty years, uh, there has been, uh, you know, an offensive by imperialism. But starting with two thousand fifteen, in the multipolar world, you find now that the U.S. 
finds it more and more difficult to contain the national liberation movements. So watch out. Thank you so much, Sir Tuhan. Would, uh, would Professor Sison like to add anything regarding this question? Can you, uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, right. Uh, the question would be, what are recent examples of successful liberation movements? And what lessons can we learn from other national liberation movements? Well, uh, a revolution uh, uh, of a national liberation character, uh, as well as democratic character, uh, the most uh, relatively the most recent would be those that occurred in uh, Central America, like uh, Nicaragua. So that would be after the big victory and big defeat of the U.S. in uh, in Vietnam. No, now the most recent. Uh, uh, victory uh, against the U.S. Uh, has been scored by the by the Taliban, no? And um, um, uh, I appreciate the uh, victory of the Taliban uh, over the U.S. because I I would uh, uh, be uh, more uh, friendly to the Taliban in relation to. Uh, to U.S. imperialism and its NATO allies. Uh, they spent a lot of money and a lot of, uh, um, and they use a lot of weapons. Um, uh, they spent um, uh, something like more than $2 trillion, uh, which is a large chunk of the money spent on the war on terror, which amounted to $8 trillion. And uh, um, anyway, uh, this is a significant victory because um, where the U.S. concentrated its uh, violence, it got defeated, no? And, um, of course, um, there is something uh, that you cannot ask um, uh, for. Uh, what about the Maoists né? that resulted from the Progressive Youth Organization of 1965 and that was doing well in um, criticizing Soviet uh, modern revisionism and, um, and uh, social imperialism. No? Um, at one time, uh, uh, they, they had a strong force in a, a one province as they um, uh, fought the Soviet invasion, but they did not know how uh, to do the political work, how to overcome, how to overcome, uh, you know, the anti-atheist and anti-communist uh, line of the Mujahideens, no? Um, so um, they got pushed aside, no? Uh, and they did not know, um, you know, there are examples in which uh, communists um, can very well uh, be in alliance with bourgeois nationalists as well as uh, uh, Islamic religionists uh, in countries where the majority of the people are Muslims. You know? I'll say to you an example. For instance, the PKI after the 1926 uprising, the Dutch tried to wipe out the Communist Party, but the Communist Party um, uh, participated in building the... Um, uh, Sarikat Islam, uh, in which there would be the anti-colonial uh, alliance of the communist, the um, the bourgeois nationalist, and uh, the Islamist. No, so uh, and then of course in general, since the example of Kemal Ataturk, no, it's possible for, to have um, a united front um, um, uh, among such basic forces an anti-colonial uh, and national alliance of uh, communist, bourgeois nationalist, and, um, and, and uh, 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 Islamic believers. Um, and um, and um, in, in that situation where, you know, the initiative goes to that alliance, uh, the Islamists that like a, that would like to have a theocratic Islamic state uh, are the ones pushed aside. No? Um, and that has been demonstrated uh, when the so-called pan, uh, the so-called modernist Islam current prevailed, as in Egypt, in uh, in Iraq uh, under Saddam Hussein, and then also in uh, Syria. 
And uh, now, uh, so uh, I, you must consider that in the last uh, 40, 40 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union and after uh, China itself turned social, com, uh, capitalist no? from 19... Uh, 76 overthrow the proletariat 1976 capitalist reforms and opening up uh, to the world capitalist system uh, there has been actually a strategic setbacks there have been strategic setbacks for the world proletarian revolution and um, uh, neoliberalism reigned with the us and china combining um, and um, so uh, uh, the, the movements, revolutionary movements in the Philippines um, uh, up to now and the one in India are the most outstanding in standing up. Of course, uh, the, the struggles carried out in Peru by, by the uh, Sendero Luminoso under the leadership of uh, uh, Gonzalo was also an important uh, revolutionary event, but it did not win. It declined after the capture of, uh, of, um, uh, capture of uh, Gonzalo. And then in, uh, and, uh, in Nepal, uh, uh, the Maoists there were more successful. They got power, but then they capitulated. No? They got satisfied with uh, overthrowing the monarchy. And so and they turned uh, um, revisionist and uh, they, were, they, they have been uh, challenged by Maoists who would like to resume the, uh, the revolution. And in turn, the Maoists also split, no? uh, because uh, uh, those who, are, who, who would be at first uh, wishing to continue the people's war would uh, eventually uh, uh, think that the game is in Kathmandu, no, and uh, uh, not in faraway huh? rural areas. So, uh, but there are those uh, in the rural areas trying to uh, continue the um, uh, to continue the people's war uh, are still very much alive. But uh, in the forefront, huh? uh, the Philippine revolutionary struggle and the Indian. Uh, revolutionary struggle are in front. That's why the U.S. would like to wipe out. Huh? Um, the U.S. Uh, is uh, very much behind Duterte in trying to destroy the revolutionary movement because it, it, it would be a signal act, uh, a continuation of the um, um, ideological, political, uh, military, and cultural offensive of uh, monopoly capitalism against the socialist cause. You know? So, uh, but uh, very fortunately, uh, the capitalist system is in trouble, and so the conditions for the uh, for the rise of anti-imperialist and democratic struggles are favorable, and these are the prelude to uh, the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution. A revolution is a, whether done in a certain country or done on a world scale, goes through twists and turns. Um, you don't get into a revolution without being ready for this uh, sort of developments. You know? If you study how um, the, uh, the uh, how the proletarian revolution developed from the 19th century, you would know that uh, the, the, the advance of the revolution is not on a straight line. Um, so I think uh, I have given you uh, the big picture, but I, I give you a happy note at the end, no? That uh, uh, it is not true, even Francis Fukuyama is ashamed of having said, no? That uh, the end of history is capitalism and, uh, and liberal democracy. He is, he is ashamed uh, because he sees how, uh, he has seen how uh, uh, the world capitalist system has deteriorated. And you know, the two big partners at neoliberal, uh, in neoliberal globalization are now uh, competing and uh, um, uh, conflicting as political rivals, China and US. Huh? So I hope uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Season. And of course, thank you to Sir Tuhan as well for answering uh, this question. Let's move on to the next one. Um, this is actually a comment and then there's a question at the end. This is from Sir Rick addressed to Professor Season. 
So here's the comment. Uh, the comment first. I felt that I had to bring up the NTF LCAC's role in attempting to thwart the revolutionary struggle. Recalling the case of Keith Absalon, who was killed in an ambush, this incident further legitimized NTF LCAC's resolve. And unfortunately, not only did uh, Vilma Absalon, the mother of the slain football player, not accept a written apology from the CPP and PA, but she also sided with the NTF LCAC. Even still, Pastor Apollo Kibuloy teamed up with the NTF LCAC for the reactionary but otherwise counter-revolutionary propaganda. And, and the, the question for Professor Season is, will it be an obstacle to the people's struggle? Uh, and this is a question about uh, the uh, uh, mistake um, um, uh, in the uh, um, killing of uh, Absalon. And uh, uh, well, uh, you know, the revolutionary movement uh, is on a nationwide scale. It is so in so many areas. And so out of uh, possible thousands of incidents in a year, there can be mistakes. And the uh, uh, NPA command has already admitted no? and offered compensation uh, for the mistake. You know, even the US makes mistakes no? with its uh, uh, highly, um, uh, with high, high precision, intelligent, smart bombs. No? Uh, recently, the U.S. Eh, um, with all its uh, technical ability, and um, of course, then NPA should rely on its uh, popular base and you know, its mass base should be, be able to get more accurate, no, information uh, about conditions and possibilities uh, with, with regard to any uh, kind of uh, military operation, such as uh, um, uh, laying the mine against the enemy. And uh, but uh, let us uh, uh, this incident should not be used then eh, to condemn the entire movement. No, this is this would be done by maliciously by uh, enemy by the enemies of the revolutionary movement, because you know uh, actually the uh, uh, the um, revolutionary movement led by the CPP is a very gentle kind of revolution. In um, in a matter of uh, in a long period of fifty two years. Um, uh, the casualties were only about uh, 50,000 and the NPA uh, was has been responsible only for wiping out 13,300 troops of the enemy and uh, paramilitaries would be included in another 7,000 so 20,000. It's the, it's the uh, reactionary armed forces that kill civilians, no? And uh, uh, they, they kill more than 40,000. Actually, the casualties are more than 60,000, not to count the, the people they force out of their, uh, of their lands and homes so that the, the, prop, the land uh, uh, would be given away eh, to mining, uh, plantation and locking companies, you know. So, um, any another sign of uh, gentleness, you know, uh, such monsters as the Marcoses are back in the Philippines, whereas uh, I am not uh, yet back in the Philippines, you know. So, and you know, this, uh, this uh, animals prance about, you know, trying to recover power from uh, Malacanang Palace, and they don't get hit at all, you know. I don't know. Maybe the revolutionary movement should think about punishing uh, these monsters uh, and down to Duterte because they have killed so many uh, revolutionaries. We should not just honor and celebrate the um, uh, the martyrs. Uh, the revolutionary movement should know how to retaliate, no? Because that would raise the level of confidence of the uh, entire revolutionary movement. So uh, that is a proof of the gentleness. Um, maybe, maybe comrades think that uh, you have to make a clean arrest uh, of these monsters. No, you cannot make a clean arrest. There is a principle in arresting. When the, uh, when the uh, subject of uh, the warrant of people's uh, court uh, warrant of arrest is armed and dangerous and is surrounded by bodyguards, you have to be ready for battles. 
Eh? And um, you don't you you don't ever dream of of, of, of capturing these uh, animals um, uh, uh, without being ready for battle. And I don't know. They use uh, you know uh, uh, they use uh, highways and streets, and uh, there, there are not so many highways and streets in the Philippines. And uh, it's election time, eh? and they will happily, you know, go to meetings, and uh, uh, they will uh, uh, they will try again to fool the people. No? So um, the determination uh, to hit the uh, enemy uh, should be uh, should be very uh, much. Uh, uh, um, what is this? Uh, the revolutionary movement should be conscious of that. Um, because uh, uh, it is symbolic, of, uh, the, you know, the, the, the reactionaries will say, oh, um, this, uh, uh, these uh, plunderers and murderers like the Marcoses, the Arroyos, the Dutertes can still move around freely. That means to say the revolutionary movement is weak, or uh, if not weak in, in, in material terms, it's weak in mentality. So uh, there has to be a strong uh, character uh, of the leadership and um, uh, the conservatism and, you know, playing it safe uh, for <laughs> uh, should be reduced. They should be more daring. Revolutionaries are supposed to be daring. So that is my, uh, that is my comment. Uh, you'd think I have no complaint uh, about how uh, these monsters are still surviving and prancing around in public. So, uh, so Duterte and the U.S. would like uh, uh, the, war, the, the people's war to intensify. So, uh, the, and uh, the revolutionary movement has no choice but to respond accordingly. Um, I hope that is uh, enlightening to those in the field. No? <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Season, for responding to that question. Uh, would Sir Tuhan have any comment regarding that? Uh, again, the question is about the NTFL CACS activities. Uh, will they be uh, will they be an obstacle in the people's struggle? The, the, the NTFL CAC. Mm -hmm. uh, Sir the Tuhan? Yeah, thank you. Uh, in the first place, the NTF CAC was created precisely uh, to uh, to I don't know to target the people, supposedly to end uh, the CPP. But the the nature of the NTLF CAC has been to target uh, opposition, to target the progressive forces, the mass organizations, and everyone uh, to actually implement uh, uh, I don't know, a fascist terror against the people. And in the end, I would like to go back to the previous question also related to COVID, that um, the question of how do we uh, mobilize effectively against terror, the fascist terror that's being used on one hand to using the LTF CAC, uh, LTF, LCAC, and TF, and the anti terror law, and also on the other hand, the COVID restrictions. I think the important thing is one, to uh, be more creative in organizing, in doing mass work in the schools, in the, um, in the communities, and in the factories. And this can only be done, this can also, the youth can pay attention to community, district, and country level organizing if the schools are still closed. Uh, the face-to-face -face organizing is essential. And from there, uh, the uh, plans can be made and in the end, uh, effective uh, propaganda work arousing and mobilizing the masses in the communities and the factories are the way to defeat uh, the, uh, the fascist terror. On the other hand, the question of the uh, LCAC is essentially, uh, they're using on one hand, uh, the um, uh, propaganda and the social media, and we should be good in social media, but we cannot be dependent on the social media. What's more important is to do 
honest to goodness uh, mass work to open up the communities, the factories, and the schools. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Tuhan, for, uh, for sharing your thoughts, not only on the recent question, but also the previous one. Uh, right, so let's move on to our uh, next question. Actually, this is uh, addressed to Professor Season. Uh, one of our audience members, Professor Season, is asking for your analysis on the AUKUS or the AUKUS. So for the sake of everyone, the AUKUS uh, is a recent new alliance among the countries Australia, UK, and the US, which is some kind of a military security pact uh, in the Asia Pacific, just made this, uh, this September. So again, uh, Professor Sison, may you share your analysis on the AUKUS? Oh, Professor Sison, you are muted. Okay. Um, the U.S. has realized that it has taken a heavy beating uh, in the, uh, Central Asia and West Asia. And uh, so um, it has withdrawn from Afghanistan and is in the process of uh, uh, decreasing its, uh, its commitment to that area. Uh, the, ex the, ex the, the cost have already affected and the public debt uh, level of the U.S. and uh, uh, so many other things are adversely affected. Uh, but the U.S. Uh, is shifting to uh, to the Pacific uh, and East Asia area, and um, so uh, AUKUS, uh, this uh, team up of Australia, UK, um, uh, and the U.S. Um, um, is part of um, uh, something that has been developing since the time of Obama, when he said that uh, he would um, um, increase U.S. Uh, military assets in the Pacific East Asia area in order to uh, confront you know, the economic and military rise of China. So, you know, at that time, the, 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 the uh, bipartisan deep state was, was already uh, concerned about the, the economic and military rise of China and the cheating done by, by China in copying, in copying uh, US technology from the uh, subsidiaries as well as from the laboratories of the US uh, where the Chinese students could go for, for several, so so many decades. But this is calculated, you know? Um, so, um, the first uh, one assertive move made by the US to have the uh, Indo uh, Indo Pacific um, route, no, uh, involving the combination of uh, uh, the U.S., Japan, and um, and uh, India and Australia. So you know there is the repeated appearance of Australia, but in the Oku, uh, in Okus, uh, uh, you don't see Japan. There is some amount of uh, calibration or consideration of the Jap Japanese position. Uh, um, there is uh, what I say is that uh, there is uh, Japanese prudence. It doesn't want to be in another, uh, in another, uh, another, another treaty organization uh, post against the against China. Uh, it also. Uh, I think the U.S. and Japan agree that um, uh, China should be kept guessing about uh, uh, Japan's readiness to hit China. But you know, I think at this time, huh, while you have uh, still a communist party pretending to be communist, although it's already capitalist, and you have some amount of, uh, shall we say, Marxist-Leninist conscience, plus uh, young, some democ uh, bourgeois democratic sense among the monopoly capitalists, they don't want uh, any war to upset their economic and military rise. Uh, it has been made clear by China that uh, it's all for uh, um, defense. But of course, uh, we have the very sad experience on the, in the Philippines that uh, China has made a major intrusion. This is the first imperialist uh, um, uh, aggressive act by China. 
uh, by uh, um, um, by claiming and establishing military bases in the West Philippine Sea. Uh, but in general, China is not ready to go to war. It makes uh, it uh, it uh, you know it, uh, Xi Jinping is practically begging uh, U.S. not to go so fast in uh, cutting down the. Uh, uh, trade relations and uh, uh, the uh, technological exchanges and so many other things in the uh, relations between the U.S. and China, uh, which have run for uh, uh, since um, um, 1972, uh, with some amount of uh, uh, ups and downs and delays. But since, since the late, uh, since the 1990s, after the Tiananmen Square uh, incident, which which, which was actually a phenomenon uh, duplicated and replicated in many Chinese cities. Uh, so the, uh, Deng Xiaoping was able to convince the US uh, to keep the restoration of capitalism in China going. Uh, so um, they must uh, continue their relations and expand the foreign investments and allow more uh, uh, technology transfer. And the US said, well, it's OK. So as long as you join WTO, and the China, naturally the Chinese uh, state and uh, private monopolists uh, see the virtue of uh, being in the WTO to take advantage of uh, countries, for instance, uh, um, uh, that they engage in the in the Belt and Road Initiative. Anyway, it, it had, uh, being in WTO allows China, for instance, to make uh, secret deals with the US, with you know, uh, unannounced provisions of uh, sellouts by Duterte and other puppets, no, um, in the in the expanded BRI uh, area. So, uh, Oculus is a part, no. Uh, you can, uh, some Australian uh, journalists and intellectuals uh, emphasize that the war between China and the US will occur soon. No, it will take some time. Um, first, the economies of the two countries, or at least one, uh, probably the Chinese economy will deteriorate uh, so much so that there will be an attempt by Maoists to rise and and there would be an attempt of the fascists to take over. Uh, the danger of war will rise when the uh, fascists, in case the fascists take over China. Huh? Uh, you know, uh, when, a, uh, when a country is socialist and turns capitalist, you know, um, uh, uh, centralized control of the state and so on can easily be inherited by a, uh, by a fascist clique. No? Uh, what's uh, going on in so we are still far from that uh, side uh, that uh, um, some some uh, uh, analysts say US is in a hurry eh, to go to war. No, I don't think so. Um, it is uh, it is uh, making signals and actual preparations for the eventuality uh, that a desperate China might become like a fascist Japan. And uh, in the case of China, it's still begging for concessions from the US. Uh, it is afraid that uh, uh, American companies and other foreign companies are shifting to um, shifting their operations to India and, um, and uh, even uh, uh, Vietnam. So uh, that's the, that's the, there is yet no uh, reason for, uh, let's say, uh, for uh, concern that war would soon break out, no? Um, I think from the Philippine viewpoint, uh, um, the, U the Philippines, the Filipinos should be able to make advantage, to, should be able to take advantage of the, of the, um, uh, the, the, the contradictions between the US and China. For instance, uh, uh, there is no question that the US and other, all other foreign countries can use the, uh, 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 the entire South Sea, or what is called the South China Sea by the British cartographers, no? Uh, they, 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 uh, uh, the, the right of free navigation must be asserted. And, and of, but of course, this is no license for the US to reestablish military bases no? in, in the Philippines. Yeah. And then, Probably uh, some bourgeois um, uh, uh, 
politicians and economists in the Philippines who try to convince the U.S. that they uh, they uh, ship some amount of uh, um, of manufacturing uh, to the Philippines. Uh, you know this, uh, but of course, uh, uh, India is a much cheaper place. No, um, uh, the uh, wages have risen in China, and it's just uh, uh, correct uh, bourgeois thinking for the uh, U.S. and other foreign companies to ship uh, uh, in India, where the wages are still lower. That's you know, uh, but that is uh, that is also one way for China, uh, for for the U.S. to uh, introduce uh, um, uncertainties between China and India within. Eh? Within the uh, within the BRICS as well as within the SCO, so you know, this is still a, a game played by uh, these big powers, uh, um, and um, um, there is yet no clear uh, prospect of a war breaking out. No, but there, there are already some um, left liberals uh, uh, who. And uh, some American Americans who call themselves socialists, who who uh, um, who keep on hitting the U.S. as a more aggressive force. Of course, the U.S. has been a proven more aggressive force even up to now. But as regards to its readiness to get to go to war, uh, there is still plenty of time to think and to uh, uh, to think and to watch uh, the the developments. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Sison, on sharing your thoughts regarding this very recent matter. Uh, maybe Sir Tuhan would also want to share some ideas regarding this, if you have any, sir. Again, we are discussing the AUKUS, which is a, re a recent military pact among three countries. Uh, maybe uh, a bit more information. Um, the the, the Indo-Pacific strategy of uh, the U.S., which was uh, Lord uh, rolled out two years ago, called for the creation of the Quad. The Quad meaning India, uh, Japan, um, Australia, and the, and the U.S. Now, the Quad eventually had their ministerial meeting uh, last year, and it became clear that while, while India because it had uh, severe, uh, severe uh, disagreements with China in the BRICS, but India was not ready to jump the ship to, to, uh, to be uh, you know, uh, a comprehensive ally for the US. Meaning to say, uh, India in that ministerial clarified that it was not ready to, uh, to include the question of security in their alliance and they fixed that the quad will be essentially economic in nature because of that it left the us you know uh open for another strategy for uh containing china militarily and that is where the australia uh, the uh, the uk uh australia us uh military alliance, which is explicit uh, military and security alliance, similar to the Seattle before. And remember the Seattle before included France and the UK, besides uh, Japan and other Southeast Asian countries. This time, uh, the, the US design has always been there, but this time now it became uh, uh, UK, Australia and the US. That is not the end of the story uh, because uh, France has already uh, signified that they have a strong uh, policy in relation to security in the Asia Pacific. Uh, and there was a snafu in terms of the US policy that did not include France, despite even the fact that there was an agreement for uh, France providing um, nuclear powered submarines for, for Australia. And I think the story of the AUKUS is not finished. 
uh, there will be still be negotiations with the France. Remember, there's the history with Seattle. In the meantime, Japan, because of the problems in relation to its peace constitution, even though Japan already uh, departed from its uh, pacifist uh, provisions in its constitution, it's not very easy for, for Japan to, to, to immediately uh, figure in a security military alliance. And of course, India uh, was very explicit that it didn't want to have a military alliance in that sense. While at the same time, you'll notice, remember there, there, there has been a skirmishes in the border between India and China which was very interesting because it was called a skirmish, but they were just having police, uh, sorry, soldiers were just throwing stones at, at each other. So quite interesting, isn't it? Nevertheless, um, uh, I think that story is not yet finished. And abangan, uh, asa susunod na kabanata. Thank you so much, Sir Tuhan. And of course, uh, Professor Season as well for sharing your analysis regarding this new development in uh, international relations. And uh, I guess I have to apologize to some of our audience because we have to move on to our final question. Uh, so for those who still have any questions or for those whose questions were not, were not answered, there will be time in uh, the future to address these questions. So for the final one, this is uh, addressed to Professor Sison. Uh, professor, you had written documents regarding the participation of the church in the people's struggle. Now, is there any updated document or maybe an analysis for the church people to utilize in participating in the people's struggle? This is from Jefferson Palasa. Professor? Well, I, have, uh, I, I may sum up um, what I had written before uh, this more recent uh, uh, article that I have written in connection with uh, the relations between the, the revolutionary movement and the church, uh, as well as the Christians for National Liberation. Um, how do I, um, how uh, I, in, in uh, quite a number of articles, I have um, uh, shown the necessity of revolutionaries um, uh, cooperating with, uh, with the church uh, and it's uh, and the church people, and the worst you can do as a revolutionary uh, worker is to you know get sucked up into uh, religious controversies uh, while you are using while you are doing much work among the people, <laughs> you know, and the, the religious beliefs of the people will come out spontaneously against you. Uh, so anyway, this is the uh, proposition that I've always. Uh, Repeated. There is freedom of both the communists and the uh, and the believers, Christian believers. Um, uh, they have the freedom of thought and belief. Right? They, they they cannot uh, reconcile themselves uh, with regard to the philosophy and uh, the, with regard to the theology. Um, uh, in other words, uh, that's covered by freedom of thought and belief, and that's guaranteed even by the liberal democratic revolution. And the church, uh, I think, has, ag has agreed to the principle uh, 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 that uh, uh, the time for theocracy is no longer uh, is no longer there. No, so um, now um, I, I keep we keep on repeating. Eh? We and that means they, um, my uh, Catholic and Christian believers agree with me that we can very well cooperate eh? on uh, on the basis uh, on on the. Uh, um, principle uh, that uh, we have we adhere to and carry out the second great commandment love thy neighbor or you can translate transliterate that to serve the people so that's the meeting point and that conforms to uh, the modern constitution of the church uh, 
as laid down in the uh, matter at Magistra, there is such a dialogue, there is a, it's possible for a dialogue and cooperation between believers and non-believers. Now, I, I wrote recently uh, this article, and actually it's a part of the book compendium issued by the Christians for National Liberation in response to uh, the calls of uh, Pope Francis, no? Uh, about uh, uh, cooperation, ecumenical cooperation. And I said, um, um, don't worry, even after, you know, there are some uh, intriguers who say uh, that uh, church and uh, uh, communist party cooperation uh, is done only eh? uh, for the purpose of winning the revolution. No, I assure the believers that uh, the freedom of thought and a belief will continue. Uh, the, the, uh, the believers will continue to have their freedom. And, um, and uh, I cited uh, Engels uh, criticizing uh, Herr Juring for saying that the socialist state must wipe out, no? must wipe out the religious believers. Uh, so <laughs> Engels said, that is very unscientific. You don't even allow people to change their thinking. Eh? <laughs> In other words, you would use violence to stop. No, and that's said very unscientific, no? Uh, because it's the scientific thing to do is to persuade people, no? And then, um, uh, and people, and there's no harm if people will uh, uh, retain their religious beliefs. And so... I, I would go as far as saying, in, in fact, uh, the religious believers have a longer time scale than communists. The communists think that their role, historical role, is already finished when they achieve the classless society. But uh, the Christian believers think that they will go. and uh, they, they, their, uh, their, uh, their church and their beliefs will go on and on. Uh, eternally, because they have uh, people have to relate themselves eh, to God. No, so I said, oh, the the Catholic belief, uh, believers um, have a longer time scale, and that is that is no problem to communists. Um, and in the time when classless society is achieved, well, the communists can still uh, uh, continue. Um, but on another basis, no longer, you know, uh, overthrowing the class, uh, uh, class ruled uh, society, uh, class ruled state. No, so um, uh, uh, I think those are reassuring. No, uh, that the cooperation of church people and uh, the revolutionaries as well as communists will go on and on. Um, there is no limit in time. So uh, I, I uh, bring up those points in my article, which is part of the compendium. The compendium is a compendium of uh, the opinions of uh, people in the uh, Christians for National Liberation. Um, and by the way, I pointed out how, you know, the, uh, what those I consider infantile Maoists, they did not know how to handle uh, the problem when the Mujahideen uh, uh, took the line of anti-atheism, anti, and anti-communism uh, by way of seizing the initiative and uh, uh, putting them aside in the struggle against the uh, Soviet invasion. So um, uh, I hope uh, what I say is helpful uh, by way of clarifying the, uh, how the United Front goes. Huh? now and in the future. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sison. I'm sure that your thoughts on uh, the United Front with our uh, supporters from the church will be very, very satisfying for uh, mm -hmm. our compatriots. And uh, for the rest of our audience, we would like to apologize again because sadly, we need to wrap up our open forum. So for those who still have any questions or clarifications, you may message them to the Secretariat of ILPS so that they may be able to relay them to our speakers. They will also try their best to address pressing questions through their publicity materials. So don't forget to like the Facebook page of the International League of People's Struggles. And uh, 
We also have a Twitter account. Actually, you may follow the ILPS at uh, on Twitter at ILPS underscore official. Again, the official uh, Twitter account of ILPS is at ILPS underscore official. Thank you again to our esteemed speakers for your insights on the People's Liberation Movements in the Philippines and beyond. Now, we, are, we have a, a longtime women's rights activist, a, a former congresswoman representing the Gabriela Women's Party, and previously secretary and lead convener of the National Anti-Poverty Commission. We have uh, ILPS General Secretary Lisa Maza, to give, uh, to, uh, to give us the webinar series closing remarks. Yes, uh, thank you, Monsi, and greetings to everyone. We come to the conclusion of this three-part educational webinar series on the Philippines that discuss the roots of the problems of the semi-colonial and semi-feudal Philippine society. Also, we discussed the impact of the contradictions among the imperialist countries. And tonight, we discuss the national and democratic movement in the Philippines and the prospects of the social and national liberation movement or, and struggle of the Filipino people. We are pleased to co-organize this webinar series with the ILPS Philippines. We thank the ILPS Philippines, our speakers in these three webinars, the participants, especially those who were with us since the very beginning of this series. We hope that this series will deepen our understanding of the Philippine struggle towards strengthening the international solidarity and support for the Filipino people's resistance, especially at this time under the tyrannical and puppet regime of Mr. Duterte. And also to strengthen solidarity with the Filipino people's struggle to build a society that is just, peaceful, prosperous, and free from imperialist intervention. In the coming months, the ILPS will run similar educational webinar series on the people's libera liberation struggles across the globe. We aim to highlight the resistance movements on the ground and learn from their rich experiences as they advance their democratic and anti-imperialist struggles. We hope that you will continue to be with us in this educational webinar series. Again, thanks to everyone and long live international solidarity. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Ms. Maza, for closing our web uh, for uh, closing our webinar today and our webinar series for the past few weeks. And I'm I'm sure our audience uh, is already so excited for our future webinars on the people's liberation struggles across the globe. And of course, thank you to our esteemed speakers for your very valuable insights on people's liberation movements in the Philippines. And of course, thank you to our very attentive listeners and audience for staying even though this webinar was uh, a bit over time, but I'm sure that our open forum er uh, earlier was very, very productive uh, in, in, in uh, helping us learn more about uh, the movement in the Philippines. Uh, again, thank you very much for everyone. And to close our program, let us listen to the ILPS hymn.
In closing the program, we reiterate our 